Thanks all for joining us here today. It's great to see such a good crowd. I guess that's a reflection on the interest in this topic. And it's also great to welcome all of the Masters in International Affairs students. I know there's a number of them here. We've just launched our new Masters in International Affairs program two weeks ago. So really, really pleased that uh, a number of you are also here in the audience. So today, the topic of leadership and the effect of leadership of international organizations is very important. And I'm gonna speak about a report that Nairi and I were involved in, in writing over the last uh, 18 months or so. And I think it's very interesting to reflect on it in light of this coming week where we have the UN General Assembly opening and celebrating its 70th anniversary, as well as the launch of the new Sustainable Development Goals. And we're also in the process of selecting a new UN Secretary General. And there's been great debate about how we should do this process and a lot of discussion in the General Assembly about reforming it. So it's a really critical time to reflect on the successes and failures of international institutions and how we can ensure they're effectively led. Because after all, the world relies on international organizations to coordinate global responses to critical threats, from pandemic outbreaks to humanitarian crises like the current refugee crises. International organizations perform very important and very diverse tasks from managing aviation safety to protecting endangered species, from chemical weapons inspections to setting labor standards. So as a leader of an international organization, you have a particularly challenging role, which no doubt we will hear about. They have to persuade member states to overcome political differences and cooperate, to manage a large bureaucracy. Many of our international organizations today have staff in the numbers of eight, 9,000 spread over dozens, if not 60, 70 countries. And most importantly, they have to deliver results. So without good leadership, these organizations are unlikely to deliver the critical public goods that we rely on them for. And the problem that we diagnose in this report, uh, which I'll be speaking to, and there are some copies of over here, is that too often leaders are selected for political purposes and not through an exhaustive merit-based selection process. So in fact, the heads of many of our international organizations are often chosen by the most powerful states. Many of you are probably familiar with the fact that there's a gentleman's agreement in which the World Bank president is always an American or the head of the IMF always a European. And you see this happening in other organizations. The head of the a F, uh, Asian Development Bank is always Japanese. The head of U UNICEF tended to be an American. The head of the International Organization for Migration, also an American. And this feeds a concern that these global institutions are captured by powerful political interests and not accountable to all of their member states. Another problem is that once in place, these executive heads aren't always held to account for their own individual performance. And we've also seen a number of leaders forced to resign due to unethical behavior, the most famous case most recently in 2011 of Dominique Strauss-Kahn, but also in 2005, UN High Commissioner Rod Lubbers was forced to resign due to allegations of sexual abuse. So this report, Effective Leadership in International Organizations, sought to tackle the problems and highlight how leadership can be most effective and what we did is identify seven best practices to ensure that leaders are fairly and transparently selected on merit and held to account for their performance. And I'm gonna talk you briefly through the organizations we studied in our methods and then focus in on those seven best practices and give you some concrete examples before concluding. So up here you can see the organizations that we studied. And the report essentially asks, what enables executive heads, so the people at the top of our international organizations, to be effective leaders? And we identified best practices that would translate across all international organizations. And you'll see we've got quite a diverse group here. They're not meant to necessarily represent all international organizations, but they have very different, different mandates and governance structures, but our practices can speak to all of them. So just to go through for those who can't see very well or aren't familiar with the logos we had, the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the Inter-American Development Bank, the IMF, the International Organization for Migration, the United Nations Development Program, the High Commission for Refugees, the World Bank, the World Health Organization, and the World Trade Organization. So these were the organizations that we were studying. And we examined publicly available material and interviewed senior officials, executive heads in some cases, as well as academic experts 
to identify the official policies, what's publicly available about how they uh, practice leadership, as well as informal practices. And the report, if you're really interested in the data, details this in great depth in the appendix. So, the seven best practices. We identified seven which at least one organization is currently doing. Now this is important because we're not saying that these are radical pie in the sky reforms that couldn't happen. These are things that are already currently happening. So I'm gonna talk through each and give you some examples. The first one we looked is selecting and re-electing leadership on merit. Here we looked for clear terms of reference for the leadership position. We wanted to see that all member states were involved in the process and that there was a time bound published and exhaustive process for the leadership selection. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this is very topical because it's exactly what the UN is currently discussing about the selection process for the Secretary General. So what are some best practices? The African Development Bank earlier this year held very competitive elections for its next president. All the candidates were profiled on their website and nomination forms and voting procedures were available publicly online. In the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the vice presidents were selected also through meritocratic process and in some cases, passport blind. And the IMF has made its process more transparent and in 2011 published its first comprehensive terms of appointment for its managing director. The second is about performance management of the executive head. And we looked to see if organizations were setting clear expectations of their leaders' individual performance, which are transparent and consistent with the overall organizational goals. And what's interesting is that few currently have a formal procedure for setting expectations of individual performance. Most, if not all of them, monitor the overall organizational performance through reporting to board. But some good examples we found here was the IMF, where the managing director has been evaluated annually since 2009 by the board based on agreed performance objectives. In the WHO case, Margaret Chan, the managing director, has published on her own accord a self-evaluation during the run-up to her re-election. The next one is about ethical standards. So here we look to see if leaders were obliged to disclose financial assets and conflicts of interest and, here, and adhere to a published and enforced code of ethics. And what we found is that almost, in fact, all of the organizations we studied had code of ethics, but there was some variation in the enforcement and the reporting procedures around them. One example, the World Bank Group had, has an office of ethics and business conduct. It also has an ethics helpline and of code of conduct for the board. There was more variation though in terms of financial disclosure. Not all international organizations oblige their heads to actually um, file an annual uh, disclosure statement, but this was happening in the UN system. In the UN system, those who do not are charged and may be penalized. And we found in the case of the United Nations Development Program and the High Commissioner for Refugees, that both of them voluntarily disclosed their financial assets publicly and made them available online. The next one is about how the leadership develops and retains the talent within their organizations. So here, one of the indicators we looked at was whether or not organizations institutionalize staff surveys and have follow-up procedures to implement the feedback they get from their staff. And here we found an example of UNHCR, which conducts staff surveys every three years, and the High Commissioner is dedicated to following up on recommendations from these surveys. The next is about setting strategic priorities. We look to see if the organizations and the leadership ha have strategic documents that include clear, measurable objectives. So United Nations Development Program, for instance, sets out clear strategic plans covering every four years and also reports on how it will implement, finance each goal, and evaluate their effectiveness through stakeholder surveys. The United Nations High Commission for Refugees is also committed to very detailed objectives in its global strategic priorities document. Another big issue for international organizations in this uh, realm is whether or not they have sufficient discretionary funds. Because many organizations today have a high percentage of earmarked funds, which mean that the leadership have very little flexibility in their financing. So one example is uh, the IOM, where over 97% of their financing is from non-core contributions. But many organizations and their heads are lobbying to change the situation so that they can get more core financing. 
and have greater uh, discretion in where, where financing should go. Sixth, here we look to see if the heads of international organisations are engaging with a wide range of stakeholders. We look for regular institutionalised forums for civil society and NGOs to engage. UNHCR, for instance, consults with NGOs on a regular basis. And last of all, we looked at how these organisations evaluate their own effectiveness and performance. In particular, we looked to see if they have an independent evaluation office which reports directly to the board, and we saw some variation in the evaluation practices. The International Monetary Fund and the World Bank both have an independent evaluation office, and the UNDP evaluation office also is independent, and all of their evaluations have a separate response from management independently. So in conclusion, we've identified seven best practices, and what I want to highlight is that in all of these cases, at least one international organisation is currently implementing a best practice, but there's variation. So one of the questions we have is, why can't all organisations be doing all of them? These are not radical reforms. Other organisations could follow suit. And I think it's an interesting question to ask for, for scholars and policymakers why some institutions have more successfully implemented the reforms and others have not. And I really invite the audience and the panellists to reflect on this. And there may be other practices that you're aware of through your own experience or studies, which we'd be very interested to hear about. One other thing I want to mention is that the responsibility for ensuring that these are implemented, these best practices, lies both with the board and the senior management of the organisations. So in ensuring that we see these sorts of reforms, it isn't just up to the head of a particular organisation, it's also a question of you know, how member states, for instance, can change the selection process for electing the leader. So I look forward to hearing your reflections and um, welcome comments from you all. And I'll hand over to Nairi to say a few words. 